First of all, I would like to welcome you to the first lecture for uh, this year's seminar series, uh, jointly held by the Center uh, for Southeast Asian Studies and Southeast Asian Art Academic Program at SOAS. Uh, this series um, was started last year and is co-organized by a group of PhD graduates and candidates at uh, SOAS affiliated with the Southeast Asian Art. Art Academic Program, uh, including Heri Tan, Udom Lukun Trakul, Kipat Kraja Jun, uh, Soka Siang, and myself. And I will be moderating uh, the uh, talk for today. And it is my honor to introduce today's speaker, Tiara Tun. Uh, Tiara is a program specific assistant professor at the Center for Southeast Asia, Asia Studies, Kyoto University, Japan. Uh, he received his PhD in history from the National University of Singapore or, or NUS in 2018 under a joint doctoral scholarship program between the Harvard Yanjing Institute and NUS. Uh, his research interests lie in the fields of encounters between Southeast Asian societies and the West, uh, for a grounding intellectual history, manuscript studies, uh, transregional culture and politics, ethnic identity and Cambodian or Southeast Asian studies. Uh, today, he will deliver a very interesting lecture titled uh, The Epistemological Shift from Palace Chronicles to Scholarly Khmer Historiography under French Colonial Rule, uh, which seeks to highlight the transition in which the traditional perception of the past initially shifted to the uh, newer history scholarship published and promoted by the colonial regimes. As usual, attendees are welcome to post their question during or after the lecture in the Q&A box, and we will respond to them after the presentation by Tiara. So uh, without further ado, I will hand the screen over to Tiara to present his lecture. Tiara, over to you. Thank you so much, Bankers. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the uh, Southeast Asian Arts Academy Program uh, for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Mr. Sukha Siang, he's not here, I think, uh, and Professor Ashley Thompson, my old professor, uh, for the kind invitation, Anna and Bankas for the, uh, for the uh, arrangement today. So as uh, uh, Bankas uh, kindly introduced me earlier, so let me try to... As Bankas uh, kindly introduced me earlier, so uh, uh, I'm honored to present my uh, ongoing research. Uh, it's ongoing because it's part of the larger project, which I'm going to explain later. So uh, the title is the epistemological uh, shift uh, from palace chronicle to scholarly Khmer historiography and the French colonial rules. So basically, uh, this. Uh, particular topic is part of my uh, larger uh, book project, uh, which I've been working on. So it's actually a chapter. So as you can see, uh, I look basically on a larger uh, time frame from the uh, 19th century until the 1970s. And uh, there are many other aspects concerning uh, Cambodian and Southeast Asian historiography that I explore in the larger book project. So feel free to ask questions uh, on this particular topic or on the book itself. So uh, an earlier version of this uh, chapter or presentation was also published as a journal article uh, in the uh, Journal of South Asian Studies uh, last year. So feel free to email me if you want a copy or you can just go to the website of the journal and download the article by yourself. So, so when we talk about uh, historiography, intellectual history of Southeast Asia. It's also it's important to highlight uh, that uh, throughout the region, uh, meaning across Southeast Asia, there are indigenous way of writing about the past. So I use the term pre-colonial historical thought and practice. As you can see, uh, like the Burmese uh, palace class uh, chronicle, you have the, uh, uh, the chronicle in Chiang Mai, Bangkok chronicle, Chronicle in Laos, Chronicle in Cambodia, the Hikayat in the Malay world. So there are indigenous uh, uh, writings on their collective past 
uh, throughout Southeast Asia before the arrival of Western colonialism, Western colonial historiography. So uh, in terms of earlier scholarships on indigenous way of writing about the past, uh, they also relatively rich in terms of uh, scholarship on this aspect. Uh, for example, in Thailand, you have a very good book by Professor Niti uh, entitled Pain and Cell. So he looks at uh, uh, early Bangkok period from uh, you know, a literary perspective, including uh, uh, many uh, chronicle texts uh, written in Thai. Uh, talk about pre-colonial historiography of Southeast Asia, we cannot uh, uh, miss the very important work of Professor Michael Vickery, the late Professor Michael Vickery. Uh, he, he compares uh, uh, chronicle uh, manuscripts of uh, Cambodia and Thailand. So I know very extensive uh, exploration of, of the pre-colonial historiography between the two countries. More specifically on Cambodia, we have, uh, we have uh, work by Cambodian scholars such as Mok Puen, uh, uh, Ken Sok, who also use uh, the chronicle to study post onko Cambodian history. So, just now I mentioned about, uh, I mean, I mentioned scholarship on pre-colonial Southeast Asia. We also have uh, quite a number of uh, uh, publications on modern, modern historical graphy of Southeast Asia. For example, a very good book by Professor Patricia uh, Pelly, uh, who explores uh, post-colonial Vietnamese uh, historical writing. Very big book uh, edited by Professor Anthony Reed and David Ma uh, try to understand Southeast Asian historical writing from the perception of indigenous writers. So there's a large collection of essays uh, with very good quality in this book. So what I'm trying to explain here is that both pre-colonial and pre-modern and modern uh, scholarships on this intellectual history of Southeast Asia has been quite well established. Has been, I mean, there are quite a number of scholars who have explore these themes of scholarship. But, but not many of them actually uh, uh, try to explore the notion of translate, uh, tra transition. By transition here, I mean, there was a strong establishment of uh, scholarship before the arrival of Western colonial historiography. Then you have the new, completely new notion of writing about the past came in during the colonial era. So what were the transition from the indigenous way to a more contemporary uh, way. So my presentation today is looking at this particular point in time. So basically try uh, to ask the question, how traditional way of writing, what happened to the traditional way of writing uh, uh, when the new colonial era historiography came in? So how did they, tra they transform from this particular point to the, the new one? So by asking this question uh, more specifically, uh, so the text I show here is actually one of uh, Cambodian uh, chronicles or Pong Sawada. It was written in the, uh, the mid 18th century. So I'm trying to see how this notion of chronicle writing changed to the colonial era historical consciousness. Why is it important? Because this new historical consciousness actually play an important role uh, becoming a very important source for collective cultures and nationalist thought. They become key element for, you know, formalizing new ways of looking at their collective society. So here I'm trying to find who took part in, who were the local scholars who actually stepped away from the traditional way of writing about the past? What are their roles in facilitating this epistemological shift? So these are the two major questions that I would like to explore in the following of my presentations. So let me start with some example concerning, I call it an early interaction with friend colonial scholarship. So when we talk about an early interaction, uh, trying to explore, you know, a publication written by indigenous scholar, what were the, what were the content? How does it look like? What did they write about their collective past uh, during the early 1900s? Then I discovered this uh, important 
uh, person who is very powerful. He's actually the most powerful Cambodian official during the colonial period. So his name is Thun, perhaps the best example representing a type of scholar who lived through the moment when modern perceptions toward the past began to take shape in Cambodia. Thun, he's a, he belonged to a sino khmer businessman uh, born during the 1860s. And he worked as a uh, translator, interpreter between Khmer and French uh, during the 1880s. Because of this job as a translator, he later on became minister of the palace and finance in 1902. A few years later, he obtained another key position as Minister of Fine Arts. So he's basically in charge of three important ministries, Ministry of Palace, Finance, and uh, Fine Arts. Very influential. So working in, you know, as a collaborator between the local government, between the local elites and the French, Tuan also spent some time to write, uh, to publish some, some books, some articles. So one of the most important ones uh, was published in 1930. Uh, so the book was actually trying to explain some special characteristic of Cambodian dance. So the title is basically in French, it's written in French, so it can be translated as like Cambodian dance. So we, in, in the book, we actually find a type of discussion that mix uh, the chronicle narrative and convention and uh, the, chroni the chronicle con uh, narrative convention with the colonial historical discourse. Tuan is actually trying to establish a historical discourse that associated Khmer Kordan with the reign of an uncle king, uh, Jayavarman II. And the king was identified by French scholars as the founder of the Angkor era, basically from the 9th to the 15th century. But he didn't find other information that was recounted in a French historical writing worth mentioning. Instead, Tuan adopted the chronicle narrative, specifically the story of a legendary king by the name Prehket Melia and turn it into evidence to support his claim about the origin of court dance. So just to highlight uh, the story of uh, King Prakhet Meli or King Meli, he was, he was uh, understood by the local people in the traditional chronicle texts and many other indigenous texts as a human born prince who in his previous life was the son of Indra, the king of heavens. And it was this king who ordered the construction of the Angkor temples. So that means in the indigenous perspective, uh, those ancient Hindu temple was actually built by, by, by God, by, by Indra. So what is, I mean, the interesting part about the book is that the writing display a coexistence of indigenous historical thought and more recent colonial era historiography. This coexisting historical narrative, the close view a sign of an epistemological transition between the chronicle and the colonial historical way of viewing Cambodian's past. So to give you a better sense of how actually this uh, early sign of transition took place, let me give you another example. Uh, Tuans, uh, his narrative actually resembles uh, that of another prominent uh, Cambodian scholars by the name In. He actually has a long name here, but I just simply call him in. So N was, was so well grounded in Buddhism and, and Siamese uh, language because he actually spent uh, seven, six years uh, studying in Bangkok uh, during the 1880s. So he wrote a, po a poem, which is still quite popular until now, entitled Neres Nkowat or Travel to Angkor Wat. It was written during uh, Cambodian King Sisovat's visit to Angkor in 1909. So when I read the poems, so interestingly, um, in try to reject the long held view recounted in the pre 20th century text that claimed that it was the God of heaven who the one who built, I mean, who was the one who construct these Angkor temples. But similar to Tuan, even he, rejected the old notion, the old perception. But similar to Tun, and still believed that 
the founding of the Angkor dynasty and its glory was under the reign of King Bakken Muli, the king that was locally believed as the builders, as, as, as the person who behind the construction of the Angkor temples. More than that, he even believed that these legendary rulers had his portrait curved on the bust relief of the Southern Gallery of Angkor Wat. So this, this particular uh, uh, gallery, so because this particular uh, a gallery is actually identified by French scholars in 1904 uh, by uh, Aymonier uh, as King uh, Soryavaraman II. Uh, so, but Ernst's assertion actually contradicted by French scholars Aymonier, who in 1904 study has identified the portrait as King Soryavaraman II. So, meaning he still holds some perception based on the local understanding of this. Uh, temples. So while to some extent holding on to what has been traditionally assumed about the ancient temple, Ernst's poem at the same time conveys idea that portray that partially denied this long existing understanding. But the case that an and to display are instances of an early form of epistemological transition in the interpretation of the kingdom's past a form which involved adaptation, resistant conflict, and coexistence of understandings. So let me move from uh, example of these two uh, important uh, scholars to another one, uh, but they didn't write. This particular uh, local scholar, he translated. He did a lot of translation. So, but before moving uh, to talk about his case, uh, let me try to highlight uh, this particular uh, aspect that uh, during the early 1900s, uh, between the 19, the 1920s and 1930s, there was some uh, the establishment of important academic institution in the modern sense. Uh, for example, the Royal Library, the Khmer Royal Library, it was founded uh, in 1925. Uh, the Buddhist Institute, uh, this image was taken by me uh, several years ago when there was some construction before the institute. So, so this important institution also very important. It was founded in 1930. So the person who was who played a very key role behind this the establishment of this institution as uh, a French uh, lady by the name Susan Capelles. So this beautiful image was uh, I found it in Twitter by Professor uh, Goodman. So Susan Capelles uh, played quite an important role because. She didn't just uh, 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 help organize the library, run the Buddhist Institute. She also initiated the, 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 the creation of a very important uh, scholarly magazine by the name uh, Kambodja Soroya. So the Kambodja Soroya, we can say this is the most popular, influential, longest uh, Cambodian scholarly magazine, which was founded in 1926. So the translation of this name is uh, Cambodia Sun. So during the early issues of uh, the publication of these texts, uh, I identified a very important person who in charge of editing and publishing these texts by the name Chung Mao. So I wrote his name here. So I'm going to talk about the role of Chung Mao in facilitating, uh, facilitating the so-called epistemological transition during that particular point in time. So Chu Mao, because I couldn't find his image, uh, so I, I basically don't know how does how did he look like, but I knew that he was born in 19, uh, 1900 and passed away in uh, 1944, quite, quite young. So Chu Mao was well-grounded experience in Khmer linguistic because he took part with uh, some uh, dictionary commissions during those times. And he also have deep knowledge of French. He was in charge of publishing the Kampo between 1926 and uh, 1935. Then he moved out to do some other job. Jumau actually participated in translating major texts uh, from French into Khmer, especially those related to the Angkor temples. So these are, this is an example of uh, the text that he actually did the translation and then published in Khmer, for example, in 1927, 
he published an important uh, piece written by Louis Fino, uh, which uh, thought and answered for the mystery surrounding the construction of the Angkor Thom uh, and the, the, the Bayon Temple, which I will talk more later on. And he also published other pieces, which also recount the discovery of this temple by the French, uh, the text that emphasizes the discovery and protection of Angkor Temple by the French government. So it's quite pro to the colonial government. So he did many other translation texts, but I just would like to highlight a few here in order to draw some, some, uh, some discussion uh, related to the topic, the larger topic that I'm talking about here. 1934, he published, he published uh, a translated uh, translation of uh, uh, the F uh, EFAO director's desk lecture. So the lecture was originally given in French in the Louis Fino Museum in Hanoi in March 1933. So the contents of the lecture is basically about Khmer monument in relation to history, king religions, uh, information about how large the Khmer empire during those years. Uh, uh, Sedes also confirmed that the builders of those temples was the ancestor of current Khmer people. And Sedes also rejected indigenous view that claimed those temple was built uh, as the work of uh, God Intra. He confirmed that it was Schumann who built it, it was not Indra. And at the same time, which Sadez also rejected all previous ideas and explanation about, uh, of his French colleagues about the Bayon Temple. Um, he asserted that it was king uh, because earlier uh, French uh, scholars believed that it was king, uh, it was other king who built the Bayon Temple. But so they say no, it was not, it was not, I think Aysan Veroman, I think, uh, Louis Fino believed it was other king. But so they say it was King Jayaraman the seventh who actually built the Uncle Tom and the Beyond Temple. So some reflection of the translation here. Uh, so the ideas that uh, uh, Chumau uh, trying to show here is that his translation contain ideas and information that give an impression of the vastness of the ancient national ter territory, as well as the glorious civilization of Angkor, the points which has never been explicitly mentioned by the Chronicle. So all this important aspect was not mentioned clearly in the Chronicles. Dumas translation and publication also conveyed ideas that display con contestation and debates among scholars as well. So not just about information about Cambodia's past, about Angkor, but also about conflicts among French scholars as well. He, he did many other translation work. Uh, I would like to highlight two more. Uh, so he translated in 1936, he translated another important book uh, on uh, King Jayavaram the seven. So among Cambodian, uh, modern Cambodian nation, uh, this particular king is considered the most celebrated king for the entire history. So in the text, they basically try to emphasize uh, great successes of this king in stabilizing the kingdom from wars, enlarging the kingdom's size, establishing a strong administrative structures and build religious public administration, blah, blah, blah. So there are many, many good points many good points about the king. But so that didn't stop there. He voiced a strong critique by blaming this king for leaving a destructive legacy after his reign because his successive programs of building brought destructions to the whole Cambodian history. So Sadez also blamed this king, not just talk about, I mean, good thing about him. Just to, uh, highlight that uh, the translation that uh, Chu Mao did during the 1930s is actually remained popular until now. So there are some reproductions of the text, uh, as you can see in this photo, uh, newly uh, published for high school students. So the translation actually didn't just for those, for those years, it has been important until nowadays. Jumao also did uh, the translation of another important work uh, by uh, a very influential French scholars, uh, Henri Massal. Henri Massal spent a lot of 
uh, a lot of time, spent many years in Onco uh, to do the restoration uh, conservation works there. Masha wrote uh, some articles about uh, about buildings uh, because he's, I think he's an engineer. Uh, so he talks about Onco Wat, he talks about Bayon, and then Chuma translated those uh, texts into Khmer. So basically, Marshall regarded the Angkor Wat as one of the greatest buildings, not only in Cambodia, but also in the whole world. I mean, some of you uh, have visited Angkor Wat, you, you know it. At the same time, Marshall also criticized the construction style of the Bayuan. So the picture right here. Uh, one of the most important temples of King Jayavaraman VII. So by claiming that uh, this temple was built out of the drunken imagination of this king, thus signifies the gradual downfall of Khmer temple construction skills from then onward. So he basically blamed this particular king, the king that most Cambodia considers the greatest king ever in Cambodian history. Some reflection here. So throughout the second part here, I only talk about translation. So it's the translation of a particular figure by the name Chum Mao. So through his translation is actually provide understanding about the greatness of the ancient Cambodian monarchs and temples. Chu Mao through his translation and publication also helps to accelerate the flow of colonial production of knowledge to the Cambodian audience. So you need to understand that most publications were in French and circulated outside Cambodia. So this translation is very important to to not just distribute it, but actually promote it among the local readers. His translation essentially give evidence of how this French scholarship has taken root inside the country. At the same time, if you look from a local perspective, what he did reveals that translation was a kind of engagement with colonial knowledge that could, that could be carried out among local scholars. So instead of not only just writing, but you also engage with the close scholarship through translation. The emergence of an individual like Chu Mao significantly helped to explain the process whereby French colonial era historical writings were brought into conflict at the local level with long held uh, colonial scholarship and later on assumed the dominant role. Yeah. So let me uh, move to my, the last part of my presentation. Uh, so just now I talk about translation. Now I'm talking about somebody who start writing the real history text. So I use a term for this session is formulating a new provote sas. Provote sas is a Khmer term. So the meaning can be equivalent to history, narrative with nationalistic views. So the person who actually engaged in writing in writing uh, historical account in a, in a Western style among the Cambodian scholar is an individual by the name Grosseim. Grosseim, I was trying to search for his background, but I couldn't find any evidence uh, which uh, indicates about his educational background, his family, but I know that he very active. He was very active in Cambodia between the 1920s and the early 1950s. He's, in my view, perhaps the only historian, the only local historian throughout the colonial period. Grossames, similar to Chu Mal, he also engaged in the work of translation, but he didn't engage in the scholarship of French. So he's mainly engaged in the scholarship written in Siamis, in Thai. So he did some translation uh, of uh, Siamis uh, scholarships, such as the one on the Mahapirata. Um, uh, epic. Uh, the Prin Dam Rongs, Rajan a very influential historian of modern Thailand. So Prin Dam Rongs gave a talk on Siamese Buddhism and Grossain uh, uh, translated this script, uh, transcript and then turned it into Khmer, circulated among Khmer readers. He also uh, translated some other works written by Sades. So Sades written in, in French and then uh, somebody translates Sades work into Thai, and then the same translated it from Thai into Khmer. So you can see three ways of knowledge circulation between Khmer, French, and Siamese during that time. 
this translated works, Sayasta Mahaprata, or same, he explicitly mentioned that he was actually asked by uh, the Buddhist Institute director, Kapales, who requested him to make the epic available in Khmer. Rosim's affinity with Siyami scholarship revealed another influence on Khmer scholars' cultural and intellectual orientation, which was not restricted to French scholarship, meaning there are many Cambodian scholars actually look toward the Siyami uh, scholarship in order to turn them into something useful in Cambodia. I have many other examples, but Rosim's example is a very good one. Uh, I mentioned earlier, N was also uh, a monk and studied in Bangkok during the late 19th century. So these are the examples of how the uh, same uh, translation looked like. Uh, so all this translation was published in the uh, Cambodia Soraya magazine uh, between the late 19, uh, uh, 1920s and the early 1930s. Uh, and then after engaging in this translation works, uh, he began to write his own historical writing. So he wrote an important piece uh, uh, in 1932 uh, entitled Sasna Pavot. So the translation can be history of religions. He finished the text in 1932 and published in the magazine between 1933 and 1936. He explicitly said that he he undertook this work because when he was a tour guide in Hong Kong between 1926-1927, the French protectorate administration has asked him to write an explanation of different religions associated with these temples. So it was actually initiated by the French colonial government who asked him to write this, uh, this, uh, this, this text. So interestingly, when reading his, uh, his, his text, he often referred to scholars on ancient history, such as Namrong, Prince Namrong of Thailand. He also referred to Sides, uh, you know, whenever he makes any claim, he also you know, cite these two important scholars to support his idea. His account detail narrative on Buddhism and Hinduism, how the two religions came uh, to Cambodia and become established uh, until the contemporary period. The same also, embedded in his text, a lengthy account of uh, the history of ancient Cambodian king together with the temples. So he also wrote about history of Cambodia beside these two religions. So when he you know, touched on the issue of uh, Khmer history, so he basically adapted the colonial framework by basically uh, summary what the friend wrote about Cambodian history. So all those uh, pre-uncle, uncle, or the major kings who built those temples, he Kusim basically adopted them. So, and he did it without giving any reference to the chronicles because the chronicle represent indigenous knowledge before the arrival, before the establishment of French colonial scholarship. Kusim actually adopted the colonial scholars, you know, to, to, you know, to replace uh, those written in the chronicle as a new framework to understand about Cambodia. So his book uh, incorporates information about title of the kings, years of their reign, religion, key temples that those uh, king builds. Not just that, he also you know, mentioned something that quite nationalistic in content. For example, uh, for the king uh, Jayavarman II, uh, which uh, has been believed as the founder of the Onko era. So has been uh, portrayed as a successfully uh, liberating Cambodia from foreign inv invasions during the early uh, 1800s. He also depicted King Soyavaraman II, the builder of Onko Wat, as a warrior who had defeated both internal and external enemies. He stated that it was this king who had built the temple of Onko Wat and all the, the curvings of his battle against the Jam King and his own portrait on the best relief of the temple. You remember, uh, I mean, this particular uh, portrait, many local uh, uh, scholars, including uh, um, uh, An, believe that it was King Prakhetok Melir. But when Krasim 
wrote his text, he said it was King Soryavarman the second. So this means the colonial scholarship now become more established uh, by the time that an engage in this uh, kind of scholarship. For the same religious history, particularly in the early session, he frequently also provided a reference to what the palace colonial has mentioned about early Cambodian rulers like Bratau. Uh, uh, the colonial believed that Bratau was actually the first founding king uh, of Cambodia. And Grosem did not abandon completely King Bekertomali. He still mentioned this king somewhere else in his text. So at this point, although the author appeared to favor colonial era history scholarship, his historical writings were formulated to fit with and draw on the convention of the chronicles as well. So this, the category of knowledge that Grosem promoted during those years, besides drawing on many new meanings from different aspects of the collective past, it conveys, uh, conveys its narrative through a coexistence of knowledge between the chronicles and the more recent colonial era historiography. So this is the case here. So let me draw a few points for the conclusion and then we can go for the Q&A sessions. So basically my presentation here, I'm trying to understand how the chronicle scholarship which was partly practiced during the 19th century have been abandoned and then have been abandoned by, by local scholars in favor of a more recent scholarship promoted by the French colonial government. So that is basically the whole framework of my presentation so far. So I basically try to understand this uh, phenomenon by three examples. In other words, example of three Cambodian individuals, uh, Chuan, Chumau, and Kersain. So it's important to note that the rise of this Cambodian intellectual also coincided with other Southeast Asian prominent scholars, such as in Myanmar, we have uh, Ting Ong, uh, a very important historian in Myanmar during the first half of the 20th century. And of course, in Thailand, in Siam, we have Prince Amrong Rajanupap, uh, very influential uh, Thai historian uh, during those years as well. So it's not unique in Cambodia alone, it's actually happened in many parts of the region. So my presentation actually tried to explain that Tuan was one of the earliest intellectuals who uh, straddled the divide between the chronicles and the colonial historiography. The contents that uh, Tuan uh, wrote his book reveals an early form of the changes in the perception that were significantly influenced by French colonial era historical writings. So after the story of Chuan, I moved to the story of Chumau. So basically deal with uh, the, the notion of translation. So Chumau translating a French text into Khmer and published them in, in the local magazine by the name, uh, the Gambodja Soria. Chumau's story suggests that translation was another way of engaging and adapting French colonial uh, historical writing. After the story of Chumau, I moved to the case of Kroseim. His works appear to be among the earliest original historical writings in Khmer produced by a local intellectual during the colonial years. His lengthy text, uh, Sasna Babuat, which I discussed earlier, Kroseim actually integrated his skills and ideas into his writing, which demonstrated another level of coexistence between the chronicles and more recent historiography of Cambodia. All these three scholars uh, came to office due to the colonial condition and initiation. While Tuan earned his three ministerial posts, mainly while he's competent in French through his collaboration with the colonial regime, Chuma Grosem obtained his positions in the, uh, the Royal Library, largely because of the directorship of a very important French scholar, Susan Capellis. The colonial project actually provided these scholars with platforms for not only reproducing and circulating more recent scholarship to the Khmer audience, but also for showcasing their own skills and ideas. 
Colonial sponsor institutions such as the Royal Library and the Buddhist Institute provided the platform for this new form of scholarship in local vernacular to emerge, which employ a different epistemological category of thinking about and a new way of looking at the national past. This new form of scholarship was to play a hegemonic role in shaping Cambodian national imagination and the construction of collective identity and culture for the remaining years of the colonial period and after. So I would like to stop here and would be very happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Right. So thank you, Tara, for a very interesting uh, presentations. And um, yeah, uh, for those attending the uh, lectures, uh, I would like to remind you again that you if you have any comments and questions, do post them in the Q&A box and we, uh, I will read them to uh, Tiara for, uh, uh, for to, to respond as well. And we already have one question in the Q&A box actually from Samsul uh, Idhul Adha. Uh, the question is why the local chronicles of Cambodia deliver some historical details differently rather than uh, the Western archeological research, such as the case of the legend of Nagi Soma and the reign of Jayawarman II as the founder of Angkor Wat dynasty. So it's probably the origin of the, uh, the local chronicles. Uh, Chair. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, so uh, I actually discussed uh, this for one chapter, uh, it's, it's about the uh, notion of historical practice, uh, the differences of uh, historical practices between uh, uh, Western historical writing and Southeast Asian historical writing. So basically uh, in the construction of uh, 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 the Chronicles, uh, they, uh, don't, they didn't incorporate uh, different sources. So basically it depends mainly on overall history uh, it does not distinguish between uh, uh, facts and fiction. It doesn't incorporate different ideas and understanding or interpretation. So it basically tries to narrate different stories, uh, basically in more in a, an oral forms. So unlike the Burmese, I mean, uh, 19th century Burmese Chronicle, which incorporates some uh, epi uh, ep epigraphic sources, meaning uh, inscriptions, there are all those uh, 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 available written accounts uh, during the earlier century. The Cambodian Chronicle did not have the practice of doing that. So basically the account that was written about King, uh, for, for example, Jayavarman II. Uh, so writer of the Chronicle did not, did not use them, did not incorporate them. So only when a French scholar came in, and then they apply the, uh, the idea of studying uh, ancient uh, skip epi epigraphy, uh, then they, they uncover those information. So because the reign of King Jayamaraman II is like the early 9th century, the chronicle was written in the 19th century. So the gap is like almost a thousand year different. So if you based on memory, there would be no way that they can remember uh, such name. So many uncle kings was not remembered or even or remembered in a different way uh, by writer of the Chronicles. So there is a reason. So my short answer is that because the perception of writing about the past between the Chronicle way and the colonial way were very distinctive. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting actually uh, because you uh, mentioned about oral history and then uh, and the writing practice as well. And, um, I would like to also, um, while waiting uh, for other questions to come in as well, uh, if I may ask <laughs> another yes, question ahead. relating to the to, to your answers, uh, uh, how do you see this this relation between oral history and, and writing tradition? I mean, uh, whether do you see that the, the Palace Chronicle was started by the oral history and then written into text, or there is a, a, a more elaborate uh, connection between the two? So. Uh... They, they are very, they, they very closely connected to one another. Because uh, 
what we found in inscriptions, uh, and I mean, there's some earlier uh, inscription which also in a similar form of the chronicle. But for many 19th century chronicles, so most of the chronicles were actually written in the 19th century. So um, the contents of 19th century chronicle, it, 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 it has a written version and also have the oral version. So they actually coexisted uh, between the two. Uh, but most often uh, the chronicle, when uh, the palace reproduced the chronicle, the palace actually incorporated many uh, oral stories into the contents. So, uh, but, but what the, the palace recount into, you know, because when, when the palace adapted this particular oral story into, into their uh, manuscript, so this local story, this oral story is actually belong to a particular locality, particular, mm -hmm. particular temple, for example. But when the palace adapted that story, it becomes collective story. It becomes story for, for the court, for the king. And this story later on has been produced into novels, films, classical dance, uh, even song, you know. So, so it, it has a very important intertwine between the two. Uh, uh, which somehow is very difficult to distinguish. Is it from the chronicle or is it from the oral form? It's very hard to explain, but they both play a very important role throughout the colonial period and after. So in my book, I actually wrote a chapter on uh, how the chronicle was still important during the post-colonial period, how this uh, local story actually more attractive to the local people than the French scholarship because French so concerned about scientific knowledge, pure fact. When the local story is more about collective belief, moral action, religion. So I think they are more applicable to local society. That's why they're still important uh, even now. Interesting. So, uh, you, so you observe as well that uh, this, this uh, chronicle uh, that may be sourced from oral history is still has importance in the uh, local community in Cambodia as well. Uh, and um, how then it today, how then they interact with, with, with the, the vast knowledge of, of archeological research that already done in, uh, in, in, uh, in Angkor and also in other ancient temple in, in Cambodia, how then uh, people uh, recall these two different stories today. So it's a, uh a bit of I answer the question very quickly and then we can pick up another question. So I just want to share you that I wrote another articles on how a story in the chronicle uh, is still applicable and influ influential in the contemporary context. Uh, in the case there was a story that was adapted by the government uh, uh, to have some political involvement uh, during the uh, the early 2000s and the the whole story about this particular uh, a legendary king, because I don't think he uh, exists in reality, uh, has been promoted uh, across the country even now. So this is an example to show that the Chronicle uh, has a long uh, lasting uh, uh, influence on Cambodian and Southeast Asian society, uh, even now, mm -hmm. as important as Western colonial, Western historical thought. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, we have another question um, coming in from Heidi Tan. Um, she would like to thank Tiara for the interesting webinar. Uh, the question would be, uh, were there any other key custodians of local knowledge and the chronicles who are perhaps well known but not documented? Uh, is there perhaps a parallel oral history project to be done to reclaim knowledge of this custodian and their ideas today? So uh, a very important question. Uh, there are always local, uh, local scholars who impress the chronicle scholarship. Uh, in Cambodia, it happens through or even now. So I give you an example in uh, uh, 1969. So 1969 is like about 10 years after the colonial period. So it's quite contemporary uh, uh, to nowadays. So in 1969, there was an individual by the name uh, uh, Ainsot 
So ANSOT is a is an important uh, scholar who promoted the scholarship of the Chronicle. He combined different versions of the Chronicles and then published them into, into a, a long series of Khmer texts. And apparently his publication was very popular. So he requested the government to get them published for 2,500 copies. So 2,500 copies during those years was many. Uh, you don't have books that can be sold for that many copies. So this particular individual uh, promoted the Chronicle Scholarship. He hasn't been studied. I actually study him in my, uh, my book manuscript. So, uh, and then uh, the Khmeru came. The Khmeru came, nobody talks about the scholarship, but after the Khmeru was over, even the Ministry of Education now republished his book and then use it in high school. So there, there's a story of local scholars who actually uh, engage in the transformative version of the Chronicle. So here I'm not saying that the Chronicle remained the same. No, they also change over time. But their body of scholarship has remained uh, very important throughout the post-colonial period. And there, there are some uh, there, there are local individuals who engage directly in the reproduction of the, of the Chronicle scholarship. I mean, Remind me if I don't answer the question completely, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I think you already answered some of the, the question as well. Uh, we have another uh, question from uh, Tom Peterson. Uh, were the chronicles written in verse uh, in the uh, Sinhala courts of Sri Lanka and many others in South Asia? Chronicles were written in verse and this allowed the composer to uh, promote the king, monks, courtiers, and so on in particular ways that would benefit the way they were seen and thought about. Uh, the way that the Chronicles depict its figures had practical implication for the public imagination, making it difficult to distinguish between uh, fact and fiction. Uh, you already mentioned about this as well uh, in your previous answer. So uh, could any of this also be said of the Chronicles you consider here? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes, let me freely share my earlier publications is a way of promoting my work. So this, and uh, I mean, you can download this uh, particular text for free. Uh, so I wrote uh, one particular manuscript written in verse. Uh, it, was, it was a text that written during the uh, 1840s. So uh, mid 19th century. And this particular text is very, very influential because of the nature of this structure because in poems it's not about events it's not about uh, you know story of particular king uh, when it's written in verse it actually contains emotion the feeling of romanticization story of sadness the you know something that deep inside uh, inside people's mind uh, you lost someone and then the wife feels so miserable miss the dead husband the diseased husband things like that Yes, uh, in Cambodia, there are chronicle written in verse. Uh, uh, and and we, we use the term Robaksat. Robaksat meaning uh, royal lineage. And, and because of this particular po poetic text, uh, it, uh, it, it accounts story about how Vietnamese and Thai abuses Cambodia. So can you imagine this kind of nationalistic text was you know, adapted by later government, trying to, you know, when they came to conflict with Vietnam, when they came to conflict with Thailand, they came to that text, that account, and then reproduce them, try to show that, oh, the neighboring country has done bad thing in the past. Now we need to mobilize, fight against them, things like that. So politic texts, I find them a very attractive, very popular, and, and, and because the meaning is so deep, it, it contains so much emotion that make it even more special, you know, compared to uh, Western historical writing. Uh, Western historical writing never, you know, able to deliver such an emotion, deep thought feeling uh, as compared to uh, the local chronicle. Right. Uh, let's come back to the question of translation then. Uh, you mentioned in the, in the presentation, you mentioned about uh, Chumao that uh, translate, um, French uh, historical uh, uh, scholarships uh, to Khmer. And I just wonder whether 
there's also work on the opposite directions uh, from uh, from Khmer to to France actually, yeah. and whether uh, this translation uh, to France actually uh, have some important uh, in the in the development of of, of colonial uh, scholarship as well. I think that this very important question is one of the cores of the, the presentation today. Translation. Joe Mark didn't do uh, the art direction. He basically just engaged in the translation of text from French into Khmer into the local language. But there are other local scholars who, who do this. But, but before talking about local scholar, you need to also understand that uh, the way in which uh, French scholars study Cambodia, they actually translated many local texts into French as well, right? So the first generation is that the French came in uh, with the help of local officials, local translators. A French scholar by the name Leclerc, he's a very active uh, person who engaged in the translation of many uh, texts dealing with religion, Buddhism, uh, code of conduct sort of thing. Uh, one of our very influential uh, French scholars on Cambodia. I also mentioned an individual by the name Chun. You, you see his text was written in French. Well, he's a local Cambodian, but he, he published his text in French. Not just this text, he actually wanted to publish several other texts uh, on, on Buddhism, on, uh, on, on paintings of the palace. There were some, uh, some moral paintings of the Cambodian palace. So uh, Chuan was in charge of those paintings. So those paintings was actually uh, written in Khmer, but he wanted to share these uh, beautiful paintings to friends' uh, audience. So he spent his own time doing some translation of this Khmer text into French. And then he asked uh, a French publisher to publish, but the friend say, oh, no, not so interesting. I don't think these, uh, this Khmer text would be of any interest of French readers. So better have it in, in Khmer. So he tried several projects, but failed. No. But he, he did many other because he's, he's a minister, you know. For example, when he accompanied the king to Paris. So there must be many programs, many agendas that the king supposed to do in Paris should be translated from, from the local language to, to French as well. So uh, I would say uh, Chuan would be a very uh, good example to see how knowledge was uh, I mean, try to bridge the gap between different uh, languages, uh, between French and, and Khmer. And the nature of his position, he was also an interpreter. He was, he originally was a translator uh, that brought him to this important uh, position. So I would say the study of colonial Southeast Asia should emphasize on the notion of translation. We have, we have a very strong scholarship in the Philippines, but on the mainland Southeast Asia, I think there would be uh, uh, more interesting to look uh, at the interaction between colonial powers and the locals through translation. Right. Yeah. This is yeah. It is a very interesting question about about the, the translation uh, because it's uh, contain interaction between uh, the local and colonial um, knowledge uh, as well. Um, maybe one last question before we uh, end uh, this lectures because I don't see any question coming in. Uh, Regarding uh, going back to Chumao again, regarding his works on on translating uh, French into Khmer uh, uh, books, uh, I was I just wonder whether his translation is, is kind of can can we consider his works as faithful translation, or are he kind of edited or revised the the the, the, the French so works we, into? Khmer. So the notion of translation here is not literally translation, they're always uh, selective, right? Uh, you don't translate the reference of the text, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, so, because in, in French historical writing, they inserted different sources, put a lot of footnotes. So the Khmer version didn't have that footnote. Uh, uh, the, the, the preface of the original writer was never be translated. So they're always uh, ideas of the translator himself. Uh, Chung Mark himself tried to write something that all oh, this text is important in this way, in that way. Uh, so, so they always select you, the so-called translation politics uh, uh, going on in there. Uh, there never be uh, 
a pure translation translation so that's why i, I don't i don't uh, you know try to explore so much about the accuracy of the text because i think uh, the accuracy of the text is another aspect of studying uh, these uh, indigenous sources so my concern here is about how ideas were transformed into the local vernaculars and now how these ideas went into conflict with the local perceptions how how this idea was gradually replacing so what i'm trying to highlight is the some early stages that how uh, western style historical historiography was adapted at the local level how they interacted and later on replaced it so i have another chapter uh, talking about this epistemological transition but it is more like a more dominant from the western uh, historical writing style so my presentation today is a highlight several examples of the early stages of this uh, of, of this uh, you know interaction between the two. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. So thank you very much for. Uh, I would like to thank Tara for uh, his very interesting lecture, uh, also for uh, agreeing to share his part of his research here at SOAS as well uh very much looking forward to actually read the books <laughs> when it came out because it's it looks uh from uh, from your presentation from the discussion we had is very looks very interesting uh to actually study them and also like you said to actually uh study the colonial um scholarship through the through this, this uh, translation uh, through the notion of, of translation so thank you very much for that and um, I would like to remind the attendees that um, we're going to have a couple other lectures for the uh, seminar series this year. Uh, so do stay tuned to the uh, central website. We will updating them uh, accordingly uh, on, on when and who will be speaking for us at the seminar series. Thank you so much for your uh, participation. And um, thank you, Tiara, uh, as, as well. My and pleasure. thank you. Anna for uh, uh, organizing this uh, uh, webinar as well in the background. And uh, see you all in the next lectures. Goodbye. All right. Thank you, uh, Pangas, and everyone. Uh, stay safe. Stay Hope safe. to see you guys in person anytime in the future. <laughs> see you. Bye.